Hi, I'm Mark Rekev, and I'm here with my co-host Ruthie Bloom for another episode of Israel Undiplomatic. Hi, Mark. I think it's time we get right to it because this was an amazingly busy, frightening, and every other kind of week. Well, the truth is, from the point of view of our podcast, Israel Undiplomatic, we had a bad week last week because we did, because of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, we did last week's podcast I think it was midday we finished on Tuesday afternoon. And actually that afternoon, the news totally changed with the Iranian missile attack uh, on Israel. It was, I think, 181 missiles, ballistic missiles were fired on Israel from Iran. The Iranians claimed, I don't know if it's true, but they said some of the missiles were hypersonic missiles. Uh, it's been reported in the press that this is one of the biggest single ballistic missile attacks ever. And it was quite a thing. And I actually got home before you, but you were caught up in the missile attack, were you not? I was, because just after we taped our broadcast, I had to stay here to do some work. And by the time I left the office, there were alerts, uh, security alerts on our phones saying, you know, stay near a bomb shelter. But I really thought, I knew we were talking about Iran, but I really thought it was going to be like last time in April when Iran did it and it was late at night and it took hours for the drones or whatever to get to arrive in Israel. I, I didn't take it as seriously as I should have. And um, so it took me four hours to get home. But in a, in a trip, hours, four hours. Explain from, why four hours. Because I had to wait for the bus. And then I got on a train and then the train wouldn't stop at my station. The conductor said, everybody's got to get off because of the security situation. We get off and had to look for transportation to get to our various locations. And at that moment, right near about five minutes away from the bus stop that I was at, um, a major terrorist attack took place in Jaffa on the light rail system. Seven Israelis were slaughtered. And um, so there were ambulances and police cars whirring by and the bus didn't come. And then finally, when it did come and we all got on this bus, the rocket started. Sirens everywhere, all over the country. And we and of course, you're told you can't be in a vehicle when there's an attack because it could set your vehicle on fire if there's shrapnel or missiles. So we all had to get out and there were no shelters around and even all the stores were boarded up. We had to lie on the filthy pavement and do this repeat about five times uh, each time more sirens. Get off the bus, get on the bus, get off the bus. And you could see, I could see in the air, uh, it looked like fireworks, like gorgeous fireworks, except that it was terrifying because... It was all intercepted missiles and um, people were crying. And, you know, the funny part was one woman grabbed me and said this prayer. You know, she grabbed me and said a prayer crying. And then a man next to me got out his phone and, and he was filming it. Anyway, the point is it took hours to get home. And it was very, I mean, I'm laughing now. And my kids on the phone were saying to me, send us your location. And I did. But where my location was listed was... Amman, Jordan. No, because of the because of the GP. So the whole thing was insane, and then it was over. Can but I can I can I say first of all, as much as it's crazy in many ways to lie flat on the ground, and you get dirt on your nice clothes and all this, right? For both men and women, no one likes to lie down, you know, on a street. But according to the the home command, right, it's actually very effective because the minute you are face down on the ground. So more than, you know, 80% of your body, so to speak, is not open to shrapnel and stuff. And you actually uh, exponentially increase the chances of surviving a missile attack. Okay, I also, but you know what, Mark, I just want to interrupt you for yeah. just one second to yeah. say that the idea that when you're lying on the sidewalk and you have your hands on your head, yeah. that if some shrapnel do, falls on you, that somehow that's protecting you, it made it, it reminded me of the masks during coronavirus. It's like, oh, yeah. That really helped. Um, I just, but you know, I follow instructions and the no, instructions I, I can are- assure you, I can assure you that the instructions are good. Okay. And I would oh. also like that. I was at home, luckily, and we had to go to our, our safe room. You know, all Israeli mm -hmm. houses are supposed to, all new Israeli houses are supposed to have, have safe, safe rooms. And so we have a safe room at our house. And what was different about this attack was usually the rules are you hear a siren and then after 10 minutes- no other siren, you can leave automatically. And this was the first time I remember them saying, you have to stay in your safe room 
until further notice because they knew there were a lot of missiles coming in. They knew that they were coming in in waves and they didn't want people leaving their safe rooms and to have other missiles strike. And that was the first and only time so far since this war started a year ago now that we've had to be in our safe rooms for, for a consecutive period for so long. Exactly. Now, speaking of missiles, even on that night, on Tuesday, you know, we said, okay, the missile attack is over. But you know something, for people who don't live in Israel, that's really false because Hezbollah from Lebanon continued to fire rockets and missiles into the north. And by the way, yesterday, and I think this is very important we talk about this because Right now, there's a lot of talk, especially from Washington and Europe and the UN, uh, talk about how Israel is going to, quote unquote, retaliate for that Iranian missile strike. Now, uh, forget about retaliate. We are at a seven, in a seven front war. All uh, Basically, it's all Iran. It's all from Iran. Now- Hang on, we have to explain that to our, uh, I think more- uh more fully to, to the viewers and listeners, why? When you say Seven Front Wall, uh, they, uh, uh, the people who are watching this podcast have to understand that Hamas wouldn't be Hamas without Iran. Hezbollah would not be Hezbollah without Iran. The Houthis would not be the Houthis without Iran. In other words, all these Iranian proxies that are firing at us from the region and beyond have been attacking us with the active uh, guidance, support, Training, financing, arming from Iran. Now you can continue. And, okay, and the first time that Iran hit us directly was in April, and the, and the second time was last week. Now, th what's really important about this is if you uh, look at is the change in Israeli behavior uh, of the Israeli government and the army it is, we have moved into a new phase and the new phase is no more nice guy. The new phase is we are going to pummel every terrorist, every tunnel, every terrorist leader. Uh, we are going to pummel them all until it is safe for Israelis to return to their homes in the north and in the south. And until we get our hostages freed, uh, we and... And also, this is it. We cannot have rounds, new rounds and new rounds of fighting as we've had over the years. And at this point, with Iran close to achieving uh, nuclear uh, warheads, if they haven't already, okay, because if, if there had been nuclear warheads on those ballistic missiles, we'd all be toast. Um, maybe, maybe we would have shot some of them down on the way. Uh, but but, but, even but so, you're correct. You raise a very serious issue. Even so. A serious issue, why? Because there's the whole issue of how we should respond to this second Iranian strike on Israel. We did respond to the first strike in April, but we did so according to foreign press reports, because Israel never officially said we did anything. But according to foreign press reports, we hit their very, very important anti-aircraft uh, systems, uh, Russian-supplied anti-aircraft missile systems, and we showed them that we that all Iran is an open target, right? That by taking out their most advanced anti-aircraft system, um, I think it's called the S three hundred or something, then we we could show them they are Israel. Can, as the prime minister said in a separate occasion, he said that it, we can hit anywhere we need to in Iran. But the question today that's being discussed is what should Israel do today? And uh, President Joe Biden said publicly, he said he doesn't want Israel not to attack uh, the Iranian nuclear facilities. I believe he said publicly. And, and the said, oil fields. And the oil fields. Now, the oil fields, I think, I think you know, though that would hurt the Israeli, Iranian economy very, very hard, uh, and so maybe that's a good target, there are two questions about that. First of all, it's not good. You know, if oil prices spike before the election, it's obviously not good for Americans. Uh, 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 for, but there's also another thing about the oil. There would be fear, because you say Iranian oil only goes to China and it doesn't really affect the West because of the sanctions and all that. But if there's a, I think there's an understanding that if we go for oil targets in Iran, then you could have Iranian attacks on oil targets across the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, and so forth. And then you'd have a major global, it'll be like 1973, but worse all over again. There's also a, a, a question here, um, okay, do that or not do that. On the nuclear issue, I don't understand the American thinking. If we don't want the Iranians to get a bomb, and from Israel's perspective, there's finally international legitimacy that we should do something. And we want to hit a target. 
and we want it to hurt the Iranians, what is the logic not to go? On the assumption that there's a target that you can hit and destroy, something that hurts the Iranians on their nuclear program, and you can set that program back, maybe not eliminate it totally, but separate it back for a couple of years, wouldn't that be, now I speak, of course, I'm no longer in government, I'm not privy to the... Um, uh, to the intelligence, I'm not in the room where decisions, I'm giving my personal opinion as someone who's been an outsider now for, for quite a number of months. I don't understand what the logic is saying not to go for the Iranian Oh, attack. well, that's because you give the Biden administration too much credit, not just Biden administration, okay? The Democratic administrations, basically the Obama administration that wanted the nuclear deal in the first place, et cetera. The point is this, when when I say things like, Actually, they want Iran or they don't care if Iran gets the bomb. They keep saying that. They say they want deals to prevent it. But that's nonsense. And every time, every behavior coming from, the, from you know, as I say, the some people call it the O'Biden administration, but never mind where it's coming from. The whole administration is made up of people who are Iranian uh, colluders, some inadvertently and some purposely, all right? And so I won't even go as far as to say that Biden is purposely a colluder with Iran, but I will say one thing. The fact that he's going as far as to say they'll give Israel a compensation package if we don't hit the oil fields and the nukes, this is very, very disturbing. But you know what it also indicates is this. Kamala Harris, one of the only issues she's been challenged on slightly by her sycophantic media is her position on fracking. You realize that America does not have to be reliant on oil from elsewhere. But the environmentalists think fracking is a bad, bad thing. And Kamala was always against fracking. Now she says she wasn't. We don't know what she thinks. But if there's going to be a problem with oil, whoever wins the next election in America is going to have to do some serious fracking. And that would be a good thing for the American economy and for everywhere else. That's one thing. The other thing, though, is, you know, Bob Woodward of uh, came out with a new book, a biography, a book about uh, um, about and it's called War. And in his book, I haven't read the book because it isn't out yet, but there were some excerpts publi uh, published and in it, he claims that Biden um, yelled at Bibi Netanyahu when after after Israel took out one of the most wanted terrorists who killed Americans. Um, and he said to him, Bibi, what the F? What are you doing? You have no. He yelled at him and said, you're the world already thinks you're a, a rogue state and a rogue actor. Now, let's assume that Bob Woodward actually has, uh, that it's true. We don't know, but let's assume it's true. Um, well, that says it all, Mark. That terrorist we took out had a $7 million, I think it was $7 million, maybe it was $5 million, whatever it was, bounty on his head from America. Uh, they should have thanked us. Biden should have thanked us. No, no, no. We're a rogue state and rogue actors. How dare he? And then that brings us, and I'm going to hand that over to you, about this, uh, what I now have called a dirty word, ceasefire, a euphemism for something far more pernicious. So I have worked with prime ministers. I mean, obviously for a long time I worked with Benjamin Netanyahu, but I also worked with uh, Olmert before him. And I remember when I was at the embassy in Washington, Ariel Sharon used to come to visit. And the most important thing when we talk about American presidents or prime ministers is they're human beings. Sometimes it's difficult to understand, but they're people. And they're high pressure jobs. I personally think there's no more difficult job in the world than being the prime minister of Israel because the president of the United States or the president of France, even the prime minister of Great Britain, they have levels of protection uh, that the Israeli prime minister does not have. Because if there's a uh, a teacher strike in Milwaukee, no one necessarily blames the president of the United States, yes? Um, but in Israel, they would, right? He's responsible or she's responsible for everything. Um, and I think it's natural that leaders, when they're in with their closest advisors on that event, they're allowed to use language that you wouldn't use on television or on a podcast, yes? They're allowed to be themselves. And if they want to say, oh, so-and-so really pissed me off, they can use strong language. I don't think that is a sign of policy. If a leader, if someone's leaking a leader venting, right? Um, 
I, I just say, okay, he's got to he he's got to let off steam, and I understand that. And uh, uh, I don't think you know I I I, I can yeah. argue with him about policy, and that he's right or wrong on this particular policy matter. But we've all we're all human beings. When you're in one of those top positions, whether the president of the United States or the prime minister of Israel. When you're alone with your senior staff, are you allowed to vent? Of course uh, wait you are. Wait a second. But this he apparently said to Netanyahu, not to his own staff. He didn't say it about Netanyahu. He said it to Netanyahu. Now, we don't know if it's true, okay? But I don't, ca- I don't care if someone vents, and I don't care if someone vents in private to his staff or to anybody else or to another leader. The question is, what is, what is the content so of gonna- the vent? And the content here is that a who, the country that's supposed to be Israel's closest ally is not behaving like one. And I know you think, well, no, you see, they have considerations. No, we are at a civil and in a civilizational war. There are no other considerations. Israel is not the rogue state here. Israel is not. And Netanyahu, whatever you feel about him, whatever, if, if Biden doesn't like him or does like him, I really don't care. And I don't care which is, well, Israelis like him or don't like him. This is a war. There are rogue states involved in it. There's a, the, the greatest uh, state sponsor of terrorism at the head of it. And Israel is being accused of anything other than heroism in the face of this what evil. Bothered, what bothered me more than the Woodward quotes, and as you know, Woodward's written these books about all the American presidents and he's got all this inside information and because of his Watergate fame, there's a lot of, you know, uh, it's picked up by everybody. What bothered me more, and usually, you know, I'm very, at least more delicate than with you are when I, the way I talk about the administration. Yes, <laughs> yes to put it mildly. But I was, uh, disappointed is probably the nice word, but I was critical, that's the right word, of the interview uh, that the vice president and maybe next president gave to CBS to 60 Minutes because when she's asked about the nuclear program, right, she says, we're against the Iranian nuclear problem. We won't allow the Iranians to get nuclear weapons. And then when she's asked the third question, should the United States, if you had information, I'm, I'm doing this from memory, but the question was, if you have information the Iranians are after use to go nuclear, would you use American military might to stop that? And she waffles. She says she doesn't. She won't answer hypothetical questions. Right. So what's the point of saying we won't allow them to have a, a nuclear? If you take that off the table, I want to say something. When you're dealing with Assad in Syria, when you're dealing with the Ayatollahs, when you're dealing with Hezbollah, okay, you can say all you want to say, but if you're not willing to back up what you're saying, what is the point of having all that military might if the other side doesn't believe you're going to use it? None. There At- is no point, and this is, that's the point I've been making. And I'll tell you something, that wasn't the only thing that Kamala Harris said in that 60 Minutes interview, uh, where she, another thing, she, she, not only what is the point of having military might if they're not going to use it? And what is the point I would like to know of saying Israel has the right to defend itself? Another disgusting phrase as though it's questionable that someone has the right to defend himself, but has the right to defend itself, but not saying what that means. In other words, yes, it just depends how and don't do it this way. Don't do it that way. Don't do it in any way that will leave you alive Okay, now um, she would not even say that that the White House is uh, in a close alliance with the Netanyahu government. No, no, the Israeli. I would say the American people and the Israeli people. We have a connection. This is outrageous. I think there is nothing here that uh, you know. You say you're critical. I go beyond critical of things like this, but mainly because. I think that you have there is a huge a moral battle going on here and uh when when the choice is to look at Israel as some kind of culprit is an immoral choice now we I can expect that from the ayatollahs we can expect that for all our enemies around the world and including from the UN uh uh what do you call him uh, secretary general we can expect that we should not expect it from our closest allies. And speaking of which, then there's Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, who wants to embargo arms to Israel. So there Netanyahu answered him very strongly. Excellently. And I agree, a very good response. He said, and I'm quoting by memory, of course, he said, are the Iranians 
stopping their arms supplies to Hezbollah and to Hamas and to the Houthis. <laughs> and yet you, the West, wants to stop arms coming to a democracy. And I thought right. it was a good answer. I know there was a phone call between Macron and Netanyahu following their there public was. verbal tip. Maybe that did something. We didn't hear a lot about it. To oh, but let Mark. me, I want to get back to <laughs> Kamala Harris, didn't though. And do anything. We'll leave Macron behind for a moment. Okay. Uh, I, look, if you want to keep the peace, all right, it's very important that your military threat is credible. And by undermining her own America's military threat to Iran, that if they cross a certain line that you will use military force, you're actually not doing anything for peace. You're actually endangering peace and stability because if the Iranians think they can get away with doing things without facing the wrath of the United States, without facing retribution from the United States, right? What is American deterrence? about? If deterrence is not believed, if you take deterrence off the table, exactly. so what, what, what does it do? And, and it's just bad foreign policy. And when America turns its back on Israel, that's another signal to the enemies that they should keep doing what they're doing and keep hanging on to hostages and keep bombing and blitzing. Now, this is why I wanted to talk about that dirty word, ceasefire. That is a word that gets bandied around every single day, all day long by everybody. All right. We need to replace that word with surrender. The people calling on Israel to reach a ceasefire want Israel to surrender. We Israelis need the enemy to surrender. At that point, if the enemy surrenders and we have created and we're doing it, creating a credible threat to them that if they don't watch out, they're all going to be dead. Then, then we can say, okay, now that you are defeated and we dictate the terms of a ceasefire, it means we're willing out of the generosity of our Western hearts to agree not to fire on you anymore. And we, everything has gotten switched around and the world wants it to be the other way around. We'll cease. You fire. You don't fire. Uh, no, we can't have that anymore. We have to have Hezbollah defeated. That means pushed so far back it cannot create a threat to any Israeli in the north or the center and to have a buffer zone with Israeli troops there guarding the, that buffer zone. And in the south, the same thing. And in Yemen, everything we have done now, by You're the way- You're not calling for Israeli troops in Yemen, are you? No, 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 no. But we did, we did attack Twice. Uh, Yemen and, yeah. and deservedly so. Okay, the Houthis in Yemen. Now, well, the, the point though is if there's going to be any change in the Middle East- it has to come from the bottom up, from the people, the people in Lebanon, the people in Iran, just as Netanyahu addressed them personally. He did both. He addressed both, both the, the and Iranians. It was very important. And I think when when he is accused by Biden and others, and by the way, the head of the opposition in Israel too, mm -hmm. not just Biden. Let's be fair. Yeah. Uh, Israelis give a lot of um, backing to Americans who criticize Israel, so we have to be fair there. Um, the, there's this this. Uh, this sort of a uh, slogan going around that Netanyahu has no strategy. Well, we have seen that it's actually nonsense. We see his strategy at work. I agree that in the beginning of the war, I felt that not that he didn't have a strategy, but that he was treading too carefully, especially after the October 7th massacre. I felt it. You know, I felt that I was with you. That's when I met you. And I complained about that a lot to you behind uh, closed doors. But in the last few weeks, there has been a very clear strategy, and that is take out as many, as I said, as many missile launchers, as many missiles, as many tunnels, as many terrorists, as many heads of the snake. And they're getting the message. They're scared. And that's what we want. We need them to be scared. And it is our strategy. And I have no doubt that right now, behind the scenes, some new incredible surprise is about to hit Iran. We don't know what it is. I'm hoping we'll just kill all the Ayatollahs. That would be a good start because that does weaken. Isn't it weak when you get rid of the leaders? It weakens their followers. So the, the, there's, first of all, as we both said a moment ago, in his speech to the Iranian people, I mean, the prime minister makes a distinction uh, between the Iranian people who can be our friends and allies and between this terrible regime that runs the country. And when we choose our targets... 
in Iran, I think we should be uh, aware of that. We should aim for targets where the people can actually say, oh, maybe it's good the Israelis did that. I don't know if that's always possible, but I can think of a bunch of targets where the Iranian people could smile if we hit certain targets, yes? Certain regime targets and so Yeah, forth. like a bunker. Mm-hmm. Yeah, come on. Like Les let, let Ayatollah's having their in, little party in a bunker and we just... <laughs> But we can did I, that in Lebanon. But if you raise Lebanon, and, and I want to say this, I was listening uh, <laughs> to an interview with the former Prime Minister of Lebanon, uh, uh, Fouad Signora, who is a uh, Sunni Muslim. And I remember him well because I was the government spokesperson. I was at the time spokesperson with the foreign ministry in 2006 for the second Lebanon war. And he was then the Prime Minister of, of Lebanon. And he gave this interview uh, and he said talked about, uh, once again, I'm quoting from memory, Hezbollah has kidnapped the country and uh, uh, and that they that it's wrong that Hezbollah decides that Lebanon goes to war or doesn't go to war and this is unacceptable and there has to be a new reality. And what you said before, and I'm not sure I agree with everything you said, but the idea that Israel is going to create a new security situation in the south and Hezbollah will no longer be on the border. In the north, we, that's yeah, in the yeah, north. Yeah. yeah, that Hezbollah uh, has been decapitated. We've taken out their senior leadership. Uh, what's left of their senior leadership, and there's not many of them alive, um, both the military and the political leadership. Um, the the number two uh, has said that they're willing for a ceasefire today. Yeah, they're sort of praying for it because we've been hitting them so hard, and for the first time. They've up until now their position has been we'd only go to a ceasefire if there's a ceasefire in Gaza. Now that's suddenly forgotten, which is a sign that Israel is doing good work and so forth. But I think is it not possible? I don't want to sound grandiose. It's not 1982. I'm not Menachem Begin and Ariel Sharon, a new order in Lebanon and so forth. Yes, creating a new reality. But but there's no doubt that by weakening Hezbollah, by decapitating Hezbollah, not only can that be good for Israel, that can be good for Lebanon. Is it possible? that finally Lebanon can free itself from this malign armed force and become a normal country instead of a failed state, that the Lebanese army can finally become a serious... Now, these are all questions. You're asking if it's possible? I think, of course, it's possible. But it's not possible if you make peace and peaceful relations your goal. You make victory your goal and you have peace as a byproduct and you encourage your friends in these countries. You encourage, first of all, Lebanon was like, you know, the Paris of the Middle East, etc. Every diplomat had wanted to serve Exactly. So, so of course it's possible, but it is not possible when you start, when you revert to your Western mentality about how you achieve these things. And what we have learned again and again and we certainly learned it on the 7th of October, but not only. Come on, Mark, this is nothing new since the Bible with our people, okay? We, what we have to keep learning is that you, have, if you are tough and you are victorious, then you can have peaceful relations. You cannot do it by saying, by stopping too early. You can't. We've seen it. Gaza we, we said in 2014, okay, we ended that with an agreement and a ceasefire. It was baloney. It was only a temporary um, peace and quiet for them to build more tunnels and more rockets, amass more rockets, the same thing in the North. We have to say no more. None. Now, I just want to raise one question that I said to you before, you know, interesting. My daughter has two very little girls, a three-year-old and a baby, and has been running to bomb shelters. Her baby was born in a siren in the hospital. She said to me that the Iron Dome missile defense system we have is the worst thing that ever happened to Israel. So I said, oh, come on, you know, it saves lives. And she said, yeah, that's the trouble because we don't get killed in these huge numbers that are intended. And if we had, you know, maybe years ago we would have been where we are now. But I said, just, I said, okay, you know, there is a point to that. There's in, in, during the second intifada, when buses were blowing up all over the place, I remember somebody saying, it's all a question of how much Jewish blood is spilled before we have legitimacy to do X, Y, and Z. I remember that. But I did say to my daughter, listen, let me tell you something. You're right. And you're also wrong. Why? Because, because on October 7th, 
tons of blood was spilled and more than blood. It was just more, you know, atrocities beyond belief. And we're learning more and more as each passing day, uh, every day goes by, we're learning more details. Tons of blood, tons of, and still 101 hostages in Gaza. And guess what? Doesn't work. We still don't have legitimacy. So you know what? I would rather have us alive and have the enemy dead and not to talk about legitimacy. We are legitimate. The fact that uh, bad actors insist that we're not or whatever we're doing is illegitimate, that is their problem. I'm sorry. There's the famous line from Golda Meir where she said uh, she prefers a bad editorial to a nice obituary. Uh, 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 obituary. obituary, yes, yes, yes. And, and uh -huh. there's truth in that. And, and I have no doubt yes. that Israel at this moment needs to defend itself. We have to show our neighbors, both our enemies and our friends. And we have many friends in the Middle East. Across the Gulf, Israel has many people who are quietly rooting for us. I'm talking about governments, yes? People who want to see Israel defeat Hamas, want to see Israel defeat Hezbollah. And Iran. And Iran. And, and if we show weakness, it's bad for our enemies because our enemies have to- And bad for our adhere, friends. And it's, it's bad for our relations with our friends. That's true. Uh, if we are perceived as being weak, it's bad for Israel's security and it's bad for a Middle East peace. And that should always, always- and when we come out of this, and I, I believe, yes, we will come out of this on top. The last few, if anyone was lacking hope, the last few weeks and how Israel has been acting in Lebanon, yes, has shown that Israel is back to form. We got our mojo back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, that, and that as, you know, we've Which just had the Jewish important. New Year, despite, I mean, we had a few very difficult days. We had one day with the, the people killed in Jaffa, as you said, seven, eight people were killed in Jaffa. And the day after that, we had soldiers killed in Lebanon, which was... We also had a terrorist attack in uh, Beersheva yeah, yeah. at a, at a so shopping So we've had difficult mall. days, and unfortunately Terrible. there'll be more difficult days. There but will. I still think, if we look at the big picture, you said Mojo, right? We're, 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 we've got our momentum back. We've got the old Israel back. We're going to win this. And when we do win this, once again, Israel will be safer, and peace in the Middle East will go back into high gear. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And on that note... We say farewell until next week. See you then, Ruth. And uh, I'll say to all our Jewish uh, viewers, Gamar Chatima Tova, because Friday is Erev Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. See you, see you next week, Ruthie.